Hi, y'all. I'm Lenny Jones. I'm a self-taught folk artist living in southwest Florida on the uh, northwest corner of the uh, Florida Everglades. And we're on, on my property here with uh, myself and my dogs. And we're going to take a little hike, and then we're fixing to go inside and, uh, and paint a little bit. So um, let y'all see a little bit about where my art comes from. I appreciate your interest. Well, I'm just wanting to finish up this painting of this. I got a thing about uh, critters and music, and that's really dominated my whole life. And uh, I'm finishing up a painting here with a, I do a, a kind of a series of paintings with wildlife and, and oddly enough, guitars. And I, I, they're kind of my version of the proverbial still life that every artist seems to get around to in one fashion or another. And the two dominant things in my uh, in my life have always been music and animals. So I kind of combine the two and uh, working here now in this owl, a barn mm -hmm. owl, in the barn with a mouse hiding from me under the neck of an old guitar laying on the ground. And I, I do several, I've done several paintings like this where I, I imagine that, uh, uh, yeah, I call it the blues barn. It kind of ties all together. But that, I've been really blessed to, uh, in my life to have had a lot of experience with both wildlife and, and, and music and and uh, that's largely due to my dad always playing the blues for me and taking me out in the woods and the swamp and stuff and uh, teaching me all about uh, his his home place of Louisiana and, and those things and I didn't have much time with my dad in my childhood but what time I did really had a phenomenal uh, positive effect on me with my love of wilderness and the swamp and and blues and jazz and, and, and all those sorts of things that remain with me now in my senior years and um, and my mom was uh, again I didn't have spend a whole a whole lot of time with my mom she had other endeavors but uh, she was a phenomenal self-taught artist and my dad was a real fine cartoonist and while he was with me and around me as a child, he, when we weren't out in the woods and in the swamp somewhere, he would draw me cartoons of things that I liked, which at that point were mostly, was mostly King Kong and, and soldiers, but um, that had a big influence on me. So when I was a young and then uh, I was living on my own um, when I was 17, and I had uh, living in I was actually living in Baltimore in a city in a real bad section of town. My mama had left the country, so I had to, uh, she went to move to Mexico suddenly in, in pursuit of a, uh, a romance. And I got an art scholarship at uh, Maryland Institute Art College and was planning on going there, but never used it. Uh, never had any lessons or anything like that. I've just always been drawn to, to painting and stuff, but I moved into a, uh, a little rock and roll nightclub down there. I got a room cheap and could move out of the, the uh, real bad part of town. And uh, ended up paying rent by doing artwork, psychedelic artwork on the walls of it. And um, joining the house band as a bass player and harmonica player. So I was really blessed and uh, to be able to do that get a taste of uh, the musical life that was to come for me and we ended up uh, doing some work uh, Frank Zappa wanted us to uh, be on his label and we ended up touring New York City and on the road here and there a little bit and then again and uh, it gave me a, an introduction to the music way of life which ended up eventually nearly killing me and um, I played music for about 17 years professionally on and off and uh, the lifestyle for me wasn't wasn't really didn't really work when I, when I first went to playing music in, in uh, I think I was 14 the first time I played harmonica in a uh, in a dump roadhouse and um, from that time forward particularly uh, when I got into Virginia and, and Southern Virginia and the South it was we can't pay y'all what you're worth but drink all you want and uh, I come from a long line of heavy drinkers 
and I always make sure that I got my money's worth in alcohol consumption. And uh, that eventually caught up to me leaving a leaving a, uh, a a rough place where I played regularly in, in South Southwest Virginia, and um, I got arrested after getting in a car accident and threatened the cops and um, blah blah blah. And I, this was my sixth arrest in four different states for all the stuff you do when you're in those places, drinking, fighting, hell raising getting shot at and all that crap but uh, that night was a changing point for me it was to quote Robert Johnson that was my crossroads and they thought it was funny everybody knew who I was I was kind of famous in this one area and I've been in the paper and played in some bands and opened for people like Johnny Paycheck I played with Whale and Jenna's brother for a while I was playing fiddle and guitar then so people knew who I was, and I had been on TV and in the papers and stuff. And uh, when I got to the jail, I had threatened a cop back in this little funky jail in this little mountain town, and uh, they 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 were pretty rough on me. Pounded my head against the side of the wall, and thought it was funny to put me in an all-black cell block. They figured I was a musician. I was into black music, so. I spent the night there. Didn't have any trouble with the folks. I've been around black people most of my life. My father was poor from southern Louisiana, and he had black friends and pretty much taught me that uh, poor people eat red beans and rice. And we listened to, you know, we listened to everything from Jimmy Smith to B.B. King together for, for a long time. He played some drums, and... Uh, at any rate, I didn't have any trouble in the all-black cell block, which I know disappointed us in redneck <laughs> cops. But I had a beating coming to me. I had threatened the cop, and I had a reputation for being a little bit violent. And, uh, but the next day, I and I went to uh, I went to court, and it was, they walked me down the middle of this little southern town, handcuffed and shackled chained to a uh, black murderer. And as I went through the town, pickup trucks were pulling up alongside me, going, what'd you do? They called me the mountain man then, mountain man. And uh, I went in front of the judge, and he told me that my blood alcohol was almost, uh, it was 23 or 24 percent. So nearly a quarter of my blood was pure alcohol. And uh, the judge asked me, you know, how does that happen? And I, I just took full responsibility for it. And uh, I told him I, I was a musician and that was no excuse that I drank every day. And uh, I was here to take, take uh, responsibility for it. And the public defender there told me I was looking at one to three years in state penitentiary in, in uh, Virginia. And I've been in the woods and country most of my life and just the, the Prison is uh, pretty intimidating anyway. I felt like I could handle the macho part of it, but I couldn't handle not seeing the sky and the birds and stuff. And uh, the judge asked me in the full courtroom there with other defendants and a murderer sitting next to me, and uh, he asked me what I intended to do about it, and I told him I'm, I was never going to drink again. And everybody in the courtroom laughed. And I never, I went home and uh, Got down next to my wood stove and prayed to God to take it off of me. It being uh, the addiction to alcohol and the lifestyle and everything, and uh, he sure answered my call because I never drank again. And, um, six months later, I, I quit music because I just couldn't be around all the drinking and partying and the hell raising and fighting and all the stuff that I was addicted to. So. Six months later, I saw that same cop that I had threatened that had made the initial arrest on me at a roadblock on a little mountain road. And I was about six cars back, and I got, I got out and um, walked up to the front to where he was. And as I walked up, he drew his weapon and pointed at me and told me to stop and get on the ground. And I told him I was there to thank him. And he said, thank, what are you talking about? I said, that's the best night of my life. That's the best night of my life. And the mercy of God, the judge, 
the judge actually believed me. The whole courtroom laughed, and something the judge said, there's something about you. That was March 16, 1981. I've never had another drink. I have no desire to drink. But I also, uh, I had to quit music, and that, that lifestyle just didn't suit me. And, and uh, it's, it's, as everybody knows, it's hard on a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of good people. But I've been blessed all my life to be uh, work in wilderness areas, work with wildlife, and, you know, had been a musician. So I, the things that have been really critical to me and part of my, my passion for living have, uh, I've been very blessed to be able to address them. And I don't play music anymore for money, but I play most days and for my dogs and, uh, and I, and I paint about it. And, I met a lot of great people when when I played music. I got to shake hands with Albert King and Muddy Waters on the blues side, on the hillbilly side. I, I played hillbilly music for a while, played, played fiddle and, uh, and guitar, and shook hands with Bill Monroe, and, and the, the inventor of bluegrass music, and just a lot of real fine people. Went to a lot of festivals. Was really blessed, and I've been equally blessed to, since uh, since I've just been an artist and um, I've been able to do artwork for Blues Pioneer, Buddy Guy, and uh, just a whole lot of people. Country country uh, genius Willie Nelson. I've done work for him. And done a lot of festival work. I've done festival work for festivals overseas for the Van Morrison Festival. And just um, I'm really a very uh, very fortunate guy. And a very boring guy because I, I love to sit and paint and drink coffee and uh, have my dogs sit with me. And I get all excited when I get near completion of a painting like I'm doing now. So um, I reckon that's about it with me. I'm a, I'm a simple man. Mm -hmm.